Oh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Nichols. I'm the president of PLS Launch Solutions here in Rochester, New York, home of University of Rochester, and a large number of optics, photonics, and materials companies. It's clear that any new research, materials research will be the driving force behind their emerging applications. Um, which brings us to Lakeshore Cryotronics, whose systems are in use in materials characterization research. Today, I'm here with Dr. David Doughton, application scientist with Lakeshore Cryotronics in Westerville, Ohio. Dr. Doughton's recent work has focused on characterizing electronic materials, specifically using optically generated continuous wave terahertz spectroscopy. What's more, Lakeshore Characterization Solution integrates the terahertz generation and detection elements directly into a high field cryostat, which as David will explain, is critical for the types of measurement the materials researchers have to do. We've had a lot of questions from researchers on Lakeshore's newly available system, the Model 8500. Let's get started with the Hangout and answer some of those questions. David, if you wouldn't mind starting with what is terahertz and why is it garnering so much attention? All right, so, so thanks, Michelle. Um, so a terahertz consists of uh, 10 to the 12 hertz, uh, so it's electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so, uh, Michelle, could you pop up uh, slide, slide one, uh, if possible? Um, so what we want to think about is the electromagnetic spectrum. It spans uh, all the way from the, the microwaves all the way out to UV radiation. Um, and historically, uh, what we've been dealing with is that uh, there's a region of, of that electromagnetic spectrum um, that uh, sits between the microwaves and uh, up to the, uh, to the infrared, where historically there hasn't been uh, a large number of sources or, or detecting uh, technology. So that, that terahertz gap uh, sits between about 100 gigahertz and 10 terahertz. And why this is really interesting to a lot of folks is that uh, this, this energy scale, uh, this 100 gigahertz and 10 terahertz uh, energy, it's non-ionizing radiation, uh, and so it can be used with uh, humans and other biological uh, samples, um, but it also uh, penetrates uh, non-conductive materials like uh, paper and cloth. Um, and so compared to, to infrared or microwave, um, you know, this, this part of the, the energy scale uh, is relatively unexplored. And so there's, a, I think, a lot of uh, interesting materials and, and uh, physics research to be done uh, in the terahertz uh, region of, of the electromagnetic spectrum. David, there have been many terahertz technologies that have emerged in the last 20 years, but as I understand it, many of these imaging-focused approaches haven't been for use in characterizing materials. Is uh, that correct? Yeah, that, that's, that is correct. Uh, so for a lot of the imaging applications, these are either narrow band or single frequency measurements. Um, and so they're, they're using, you know, just a narrow region of this, this terahertz regime to, to penetrate through, through paper and clothing. Um, but when we start talking about materials, um, just a narrow frequency range uh, doesn't doesn't really matter. Like it uh, it doesn't tell you about what's going on necessarily over the uh, over the entire uh, frequency range. And so, or if we we're looking here at uh, a plot of the this electromagnetic spectrum, and so this is some work that uh, was published uh, a few years back that sort of shows the the broad range of material responses that can happen at terahertz frequencies. And so uh, when we're looking at materials characterization, what we want to think about is, is uh, providing a solution that, that measures not just a single frequency in the terahertz range, but has a, a broad frequency uh, range to, to hash out um, these material responses. David, what are some of the advantages for those using terahertz radiation for materials study? Uh, so, so principally, uh, the, the first is actually what we're looking at with these material phenomena is that there are a large number of uh, interactions that happen in materials that happen at these energy scales. And so um, terahertz can couple very strongly. One of those, uh, one of those uh, materials phenomena is, is the carrier uh, motion. And so free carrier or so electronic materials couple very strongly to, to terahertz light. So what we can do is we can uh, understand better the, the, the conduction mechanisms and materials by, by focusing uh, terahertz light onto those materials. So if, uh, we pop over to 
uh, the next set of slides. Um, the other issue is the wavelength. Um, so, so the slides that up now is the uh, the energy scale per terahertz. So two and a half terahertz consists around 10, 10 MeV. So this is a very uh, low energy. So we can excite the motion of carriers in a material without actually exciting anything, any other phenomena that, that can happen in the material. Um, the next slide, if we pop over to that, um, the wavelength is is one of the other uh, real critical uh, advantages for, for using terahertz. And so um, we're able to couple strongly with the free carrier motion in the material. Um, but th while there are other solutions out there that allows this non-contact evaluation of free carrier motion in materials, um, the wavelength is actually much longer than that of what we find in the terahertz range. And so typically what you need is you need to have uh, a sample that's, that's two inches in diameter. Um, and what we found is um, that for a lot of research grade materials, uh, the growth is done on much, much smaller substrates. So typically a 10 by 10 millimeter substrate. Um, this saves costs on, on substrate material, but um, if we're using the, the conventional uh, characterization method, that small sample, uh, is it, you're not going to get good results uh, using these conventional techniques. And so uh, what we've, we've found is that uh, by using terahertz, we can couple more efficiently to these, these smaller samples and allow non-contact evaluation for these research-grade materials. The development of this system has been a long process for you in Lakeshore. There were bound to be some real challenges. Can you tell me a little about those? Yeah, so uh, this has been uh, a two-year process of, of development. Um, or we, we've really had to start from, from the ground up. And one of the, the real uh, key elements here is, is these uh, in situ uh, cry, cryogenically compatible uh, emitters and detectors. And so what we've done is we've placed uh, a terahertz emitter and terahertz detector inside the cryogenic and high field environment um, and in proximity to the, uh, to the, uh, the sample under test. Uh, what that allows us to do is uh, a user can come in and, and place the, the sample uh, easily in there without any having to align uh, large amounts of optics. Now, in order to make these uh, emitters work um, in, in these extreme environments, we spent a lot of time uh, putting together a cryogenically compatible package, uh, which allows us to thermally cycle these many, many times without having to realign them uh, or without them falling apart. Uh, those alignment states are both uh, thermally stable as well as stable uh, in these high field environments. And so um, this is this has taken a, a fair amount of work to, to engineer this solution, but we found that this is a really, really useful um, it, environment, uh, which, you know, with uh, the easy sample insertion and, and without having to do all the alignment, it really can, can move sample measurements through quickly um, and, uh, and efficiently. Thank you. You've addressed those challenges, and now you have a system for sale. Can you tell me about that system? Yeah, so what we wanted to do is, is think a lot about how, how researchers uh, need to approach these, these tariffs measurements. And, and so environment is, is, is really key. Um, so what we've done is we've taken those, the, the terahertz uh, transmission measurement and coupled it into an integrated system. Uh, so the system consists of uh, the, the cryostat, um, which allows sample measurements from uh, around 5 Kelvin all the way up to 300 Kelvin, and that's surrounded by a 9 Tesla magnet. Um, this whole cryogenic and high magnetic field platform uh, is supported by uh, an instrumentation rack uh, and a spectrometer, uh, which sits there on the left side of the, the slide that's up. Um, this this uh, software, uh, application software, basically runs uh, the integrated controls. So it, it programmatically allows uh, a user to cycle through temperatures uh, and, and through magnetic fields uh, while stopping and doing terahertz spectroscopy at say, each of these, uh, each of these uh, measurement data points. And so uh, it, it's a programmatic approach to, to doing sample measurements of terahertz frequencies in these extreme environments. Each of the components is impressive and a bit of a breakthrough. What's the key to the entire system? Yeah, so what, while integration has taken its while, uh, the, the heart and soul of, of this uh, system is the terahertz spectrometer. And so uh, when we pop over to those slides, what we've done is we've, um, we've put together a continuous wave terahertz spectrometer. And so this is a low-cost solution to doing terahertz spectroscopy. Um, it consists of two uh, 
DFB lasers uh, that are tuned to slightly different frequencies. And so when we add those two, uh, those two t uh, IR uh, frequency light together, what we get is we get an amplitude modulation uh, of the IR light. Now we can use that uh, amplitude modulation um, to both generate and to detect um, the, the terrorist light. And because we're using these low-cost DFB lasers, uh, the, the overall package uh, is, is externally cost-effective um, compared with other, um, other uh, tarot solutions. And it's compatible with this uh, approach of putting the, uh, the sample uh, as well as the emitters and detectors in the, in the cryogenic environment. So we can fiber couple to uh, our emitters and detectors, uh, again, eliminating the optical alignment challenges that would come uh, with uh, trigger conventional approaches to doing cryogenic or high magnetic field spectroscopy. Thank you. So what kinds of samples is continuous wave spectroscopy particularly useful for? Yeah, so uh, like uh, conventional uh, approaches so far to, to terror spectroscopy, you know, we, we, the, the bulk film is, is, you know, the semiconductor uh, substrate is a fairly conventional approach. Uh, but with uh, continuous wave uh, terrorist spectroscopy, um, our approach to how we do our signal analysis has to be a little bit different. So uh, because we're using continuous wave source, um, there's uh, multiple reflections of the terrorists uh, that happen inside of the substrate. Uh, and when we uh, look at that terrorist light uh, with the detector, uh, what we see is really an interference of, mul of these multiple passes through the substrate. Um, so on the right side of that slide there, what you see is the, uh, this interference pattern where we get uh, frequencies where we have uh, large uh, transmission and then uh, there are troughs in that transmission. And so that's, that's fixed by the thickness of, of the sample as well as the, the index of the material. And so by, by modeling this multiple uh, reflections in the sample, we're able to extract uh, information about the, uh, the index of refraction, the complex index of refraction of, of materials. Um, and uh, the little slide down there, uh, picture on the bottom, is, is that of the, the thin film uh, of soap. And so uh, folks have, uh, you know, seen these where you, you see these dark and light um, patches and thin films of, of, of soap. Um, you know, the semiconductor substrate is, is an analogous to this approach where we're, the light and dark uh, tells us about the index um, and the... Uh, as well as the thickness, uh, so those can come out. Now, where we think that uh, continuous wave spec uh, terrorist spectroscopy uh, can be really powerful, if we pop over to the next slide, um, is this uh, the approach where we have a substrate, and now we put a conductive thin film uh, on one surface of, of that substrate. And so what this does is this is going to modify some of the boundary conditions um, of this multiple reflections inside of, of the, the substrate. Um, and depending on the, the uh, conductivity and the thickness of that, that thin film, uh, we see very dramatic changes in the continuous wave terror spectrum. And so uh, we show on the right is uh, for a, a, a film that we maintain the carrier concentration and the, and the uh, uh, conductivity of that material and just make a thicker and thicker film. What you see is you'll see a, a drop in the, in the terror's transmission, but you also see a, a phase change in the, uh, uh, a phase change in the, um, interference pattern. And so we're, we're able to extract very, uh, with very high precision, you know, the, the conductivity of these, these thin films. Uh, likewise, um, by changing the carrier concentration, so by annealing or changing doping conditions, we see this, this, uh, this change in the, uh, in the interference pattern. And so what we're really doing is we're using the substrate sort of as a resonator um, uh, to, to measure um, the, the properties of the thin film on, on one side of the substrate. And so, uh, if we pop over the next slide, next few slides, we just kind of talk you uh, talk uh, folks through um, and where we found some utility in this. And so, uh, we've been doing some work with uh, uh, collaborators at, at Ohio State, working uh, with this material called uh, SCRO or strontium chromium uh, radium oxide. And so, it's an interesting material in the sense that it has uh, some spintronic applications. Um, so, it's a it's a half metal that uh, can polarize the spin current as it's passed through. Um, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to use terrorist spectroscopy uh, to, to measure the um, uh, to measure the properties of thin films. And so these are these are 20 nanometer to, to micron thick films of, of this material. Uh, and we wanted to see what we could learn about uh, the, the carrier uh, 
uh, mobilities in, in these materials, um, uh, especially with temperature. And so uh, I would pop over to a couple, the next slide, kind of talk a little bit about how uh, how these uh, these films are made. Uh, so these are, are stoichiometric uh, measure uh, films that are grown on uh, on on substrates, and so this is a very slow process of, of deposition. So a micron thick film can take up to 20 hours. Um, you know, the those materials are grown on on these small research grade substrates, so 10 by 10 millimeter substrates. Um, and after characterization, what we want to do is uh, typically those wafers are diced up and sent to, to different users for um, further characterization or, or actually even trying to make some devices on them. And so what we found is that, you know, wafer real estate is, is at a premium. Um, so electrical contacts are basically going to reduce the, the amount of material that's available for, for other characterization. Um, and so a non-contact evaluation technique like terahertz, um, I think, is, is really useful and powerful for this, uh, for materials like this. Um, and then we want to toss in the cryogenic characterization because it allows us to vary uh, the conductivity in the material and, and see how the, the uh, this conductivity changes uh, with temperature. And so we pop over uh, the next slide. Um, what we'll, we'll see here is uh, is a typical uh, terahertz frequency spectra on the right hand side. And so what we see is uh, see you know several spectra there with temperature. The the blue line uh, is at 300 Kelvin, and as we cool that down, we see these these multiple uh, Interference fringes inside of uh, inside of the substrate, and so what we what you're seeing there is as the the con conductivity of the thin film changes, uh, these etalons or these uh, interference fringes are changing with temperature, uh, and so if we just uh, we've done some uh, corresponding electrical measurements on these thin, these thin films, that's what's shown on the right, and so if we just take the DC values, this is just the uh, uh, electrically measured uh, DC value of the conductivity and put that into our model, um, we're actually able to, to reproduce the uh, sort of this, this temperature dependent change in the, in, in the etalon feature of the terahertz spectra. Um, but we found is actually uh, it goes a little bit farther. We pop over to the, the slide that follows. And, and at low temperature, we, we actually have a little bit different um, we find something interesting in this case. And so if we just use the DC value of the conductivity in there, um, at higher frequencies, there's actually lower terahertz transmission than at, um, at the lower frequencies. And what this tells you is basically the, the film is more conductive at higher frequencies than it is at lower. And so um, we were able to apply some conductivity models uh, to this, which is uh, the one that ended up working out well for us is this variable range hopping. Um, and so at low temperatures, what's happening is that, you know, the, the free carriers are, are actually really no longer uh, free to move in the material. They're, they're, they're not uh, responding uh, to, to low frequency um, terahertz light, but respond well to the higher frequency. Uh, and, you know, looking at the material, um, what this, this is indicative of is a large number of defects, uh, which lowers the conductivity and changes the material. Uh, material properties of these thin films. And so um, this is really kind of a prototypical example of what we think continuous wave terahertz spectroscopy is, uh, is useful for and, and has a lot of power for, for enabling, uh, you know, characterization of new materials of, uh, of more, you know, of even uh, conventional materials that are being deposited uh, with different techniques. So you change the deposition technique and um, we might be able to, to tell you something about how uh, the conductivity in the material uh, has been changed. David, what about the measuring and studying the mobility of electrons in graphene materials? Yeah, so the graphene uh, looks a lot like this thin film on substrates. So typically, uh, graphene is either exfoliated or, or grown uh, with CVD, and then uh, they're transferred to you know either uh, typically uh, silicon samples or uh, sapphire samples, uh, depending on 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 the application. And so what we have is a substrate, a non-conductive substrate with a conductive uh, thin film on top of that, and so. Um, Prototypic, you know, this prototypical example uh, where we, we use the thin film to uh, to change the boundary condition of that substrate and uh, from uh, applying models of, of the terahertz transmission as well as models of the conductivity um, should be able to extract uh, information about the mobility uh, of, the, of the graphene. Thank you. Uh, you and your development partners have run a number of materials samples. 
Can someone submit a sample to see how well it performs? Uh, absolutely. So we've we've already uh, received a, a few customer samples. We've had uh, customers come to Lakeshore and uh, visit, and um, we've been able to work through uh, through some sample measurements. And so uh, we're really excited to try new materials in the system. Um, We've developed some some models for looking at, at different materials to see which ones are are um, going to work well, uh, and so um, we're always we're always looking to collaborate um, to uh, look at just a variety of things um, that fit into this uh, low temperature, variable temperature, and high magnetic field uh, platform. Great, and to submit a sample, they would contact sales. Yep. Uh, so the best way to do this is contact uh, sales at lakeshore.com. Uh, our sales uh, rep will talk to you about uh, the measurement that uh, you're trying to do, uh, and then those samples actually will end up in my hands um, eventually, and uh, we'll you know discuss how best to do these measurements. Thank you, David. Um, anyone watching can visit lakeshore.com for more on the terahertz system, the Model 8500 and more on the beta findings through your ongoing partnerships with Ohio State University, University of Arizona, the Air Force, and others. Um, we'll be publishing more findings all the time, and there's a, quite a few articles on the blog. Um, we'll also post these slides so that you can see them a little closer after the video. Or, David, they could email you directly. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so my email address is, is on the Lakeshore website, and uh, you know I look forward to, to talking with researchers about uh, the measurement needs at Territ's frequencies. Great. David, thank you, and thank you all for joining us today.